and welcome to the Codex Cantina where we have a special guest today. Hi, I'm Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space. And we will leave a link to her channel down below to go check her out. Christy was gracious enough to kind of reach out to me and said, hey, there's this Karitathon going on. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about why we chose to read this book today? Lemon by Kwon, is it Kwon Yeo Sun? Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, pretty closely. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I asked Una if there was any Korean books that he would like to read, anything translated from Korean. And instantly he was like, Lemon, I've been wanting to read this. So I looked it up. It's gotten so much attention and I was instantly very excited to read it. So thank you for picking it out. Happily, happily. Now, with that said, there's, of course, a lot of spoiler free discussions out there. And I thought maybe what we could do today is just do touch on some, you know, brief for people who haven't read this book. What's it about? What's the premise of this? Who's this book for to help them make up their mind? And then there's not a lot of spoiler discussion. So maybe we can kind of sneak in some of that there and kind of really dive in because this is a book when you're done, I feel like I just had to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there's so on the surface, it looks like it's just a mystery kind of thriller kind of a book kind of almost straddles the line there. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it has a lot of deeper topics to talk about. So I'm really glad you wanted to discuss it in depth. So it starts off with um, telling us that a high school senior in South Korea was murdered around the time of the FIFA Cup happening um, in Korea. And so there are two main suspects of her murder. Um, one is a rich kid. One is the poor kid. And the police seem to really target the poor kid. But people have all theory, all, all kinds of theories about which one of them is the real murderer. So... Although there is plot resolution in this, it has a good plot. Um, there's also those deeper topics, so mm -hmm. we can jump into those. Okay, okay. So f real quick before we do that, then now who would you say that this is a book for? Because when I was starting off, I told like even though like all the reviewers are like, this isn't a murder mystery. This is not a who done it. I couldn't help but still get who done it feelings. I was like so curious, and it really kept me on the edge of my seat. I would say I, I was from page one to page 160. I was engaged the whole way through. And I'm not normally a murder mystery type of person. Who would you say that this is a book for, per se? I think murder mystery fans would definitely enjoy this. Mm -hmm. Although, again, it um, I, I didn't find the mystery particularly uh, surprising. The main mystery, there is a <laughs> secondary mystery, which... I did find surprising and I didn't even <laughs> notice it until Una pointed it out. Um, or at least by the end of it, I, I had forgotten. And as I was reviewing my notes, I was like, oh, this has, there's plants. Okay, I see it. So it is crafted very carefully to have a strong plot, um, a couple <laughs> strong plots, but um, the deeper themes are also there. So I think that maybe literary readers could also enjoy um, thinking about that. And if you're um, curious about Korea as a setting, there are some specifically Korean elements to this book that could just help you get a little more familiar with the culture. So I think it really straddles the line nicely between literary and genre fiction, it, whatever those really mean. You know, it's kind of upmarket in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Because I think sometimes when you look at mystery, I mean, there's a wide range of mysteries, too. Right. Like you've got cozy, easy to read, consumable ones, but you've got really complex ones like right? on the complexity scale. I would say this is on the more complex side where it's uh, it's challenging. Right. And I think it's a rewarding, challenging, at least for me, that it was the way I took it, because some of the narrations and the details, they're hazy. Right. Like as a reader, you're tr you're trying to pick out what are these details that I care about in order to understand what even is happening sometimes. Yeah, she has some stylistic choices that she does that I, you know, I'm not a huge mystery reader normally, but I've never really read anything like this. So mm -hmm. I enjoyed the, her POV choices were interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so that's kind of like who it's for, kind of the premise, you know, encouraging people. Let me, maybe let's offer like that spoiler discussion of like, wait, what did I just read? Was this really what it is? Let's Let's get into some details here, if you will. So we've got, 
three narrators across eight chapters. Right? We've got Daon, right, who's the younger sister, I believe it is, of the murder victim, Haeon. Right. And I'm going to do my best with the pronunciation, but I, I don't study Korean. I'm not, you know, we're very good at it. So feel free to, you know, correct me as we go along. So Daon is one of our narrators, right? Now you corrected me. I have Sang Hui as one of the other ones who's like the, the schoolmate, but I accidentally called her, is it On Wee? Like, which Onwi. I guess yeah. is older yeah, sister. So what, is, what is that? Yeah, so in Korea, people, and I, I think you said that this is how it's done in Japan as well, they will refer to people who are older th- to them, older than them as, you know, auntie or older sister, depending on the age gap. Mm-hmm. And they will refer to, p- to people based on their title a lot of times rather than their name. So you don't necessarily go around saying you or um, you is actually a, a term that they don't use very often from what mm-hmm. I can tell. Right. And they don't use names. Right. They would say older sister or especially in a school setting, older sister, older brother, et cetera. Yep. yep. No, it's the same way in, in Japan, like where you try to avoid you. There's like so many different words for you too. Like there's the respectful version. There's the ordering command version, but you still avoid that. Like you try to use names for the most part to kind of try to be a little bit more polite. So she was the narrator of the second chapter, and it took me a little bit to get there, back to Daun, and then on to our narrator, Tarin, right, who is the second most beautiful girl at school is kind of how I read it. Is that, is that how you right. took that as well? Yes, okay. yeah. The, at the beauty standards were really tracked very carefully in this novel, which I think is one of the things that makes this a very uniquely Korean novel. Um, there, there's, there is a hierarchy based on looks. Um, I don't know how realistic that is to Korea, but I know that there is very high Korean beauty standards and like plastic surgery is a big thing. Um, I think, yeah, they just have very uh, attention to style very much so. Okay. Okay. I, um, obviously very limited my experience. I'm looking to expand my, my experience and knowledge here. (laughs) Like my first kind of like, I, I can't say that this is unique and it's actually kind of embarrassing, but kind of like the main introduction, I guess, was Gangnam style, I guess, in a sense of learning about the style where I'm like, what the heck is that? Like, there's a district for this. Like I had to kind of like Google, like, what is this? Just because it got me interested. It got me curious in Korean, you know, culture in the same way that you read a, a book like this. And it's like, oh, like I want to learn more about this. And you kind of piecemeal your experience part by part, I guess, in a sense. Yeah, exactly. Something will grab your attention and you'll learn about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's start out with the premise, right? The the idea of Han Manu, okay, the lower income person suspect you were referring to earlier, is on the scooter. He's got Tareem behind him, you know, the second prettiest girl. It's cool behind yes. him, right? And they see this van where we've got uh is it Shun Shin Jung Jung as the second suspect sitting next to the murder suspect. Hey-on. And that's that's the thing that we're examining from a thousand different perspectives. What did you think about the theme of beauty and Tareem kind of wanting to see what well, hey, where's hey where's Hayun going with this guy and her eventually marrying the guy? Like, did you uh did you think there were some interior like ulterior motives there? I definitely think that she was probably jealous. I think she did have her eye on the male in the car, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that she probably was jealous of Heon. Um, and it seems like most people didn't really know what Heon's personality was like because yeah. they would just judge her based on her looks. So, um, Tarim, Tarim, is that her name? I think. Um, I say, t- yeah. I think um so she was basically uh thinking that Heon was hitting on the guy <laughs> was mm-hmm. what was going on there right right and it's interesting the assumption of shorts right like well her legs are spread obviously she's wearing a you know shorts because who would wear a dress and have their legs spread in the car right, right? Mm-hmm. and and that's even kind of like um maybe a subtle assumption of um I don't want to say sexuality, but I want to say like enticement, right? Like sitting mm-hmm. in a seductive manner can be a form of enticement, I guess, to the male. And when Tareem sees this, right, when she sees that she's sitting open and unladylike, 
Like she's probably feeling like, you know, she's moving in on the guy is one of the way, one of the motives that you see because she does marry him later on. Right. 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 Yeah. It seems like everybody, you know, kind of, like I said, did judge Heon based on her looks. But in reality, when we see Heon from her sister's perspective, this is this is one of the things that you get from the different perspectives is you learn what Heon was really like, which is, you know, she was kind of oblivious to her own beauty and to a lot of the social interactions. Like those just weren't things that interested her very much. So yeah. she just honestly didn't think about those things. Yeah. My uh, So what I did is when I was reading this chapter by chapter, every after every chapter, I'm like, okay, honey, I'm telling my wife, this is what happened, right? And after that first chapter, uh, Daon admits that she had plastic surgery to start to look more like her sister, right? In terms of physically looking more like her sister having surgery. My, my wife was immediately like, okay, I'll bet you Daon did it. I'll bet you like, like she's got like some obsessive thing to look like her. And then we learn later on that it was uh, a form of grief, a way of kind of dealing with the loss of her sister. And what did her sister mean to her life? Crazy plot device there in terms of saying a character had surgery to look like someone else. Well, how did you take that when you read that? I know it. Yeah. The, the forms of grief in this novel, it did take several different, um, people people grieved in different ways mm -hmm. let's say and that that is a very to, to us that may sound like a very strange way to grieve um but again i think i was watching um as as part of core readathon chloe from um read with chloe or books with chloe um she had a live stream with several korean american authors on her channel and they did talk about the prevalence of plastic surgery in korean culture and how like your um, Ajuma or your grandma would just, you know, kind of sneak you some money and be like, you know, go get double eyelid surgery or whatever. And so it's really very, very common. Um, okay. And so I think probably, you know, Down, Down had a little more access or her brain was already kind of there because of maybe the culture where she's living. Um, and so it was just something for her to try, I guess. She had a really hard time grieving um, and it wasn't until the end that we really see her coming to some sort of resolution in her mind about it, healthy or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when the police are investigating, you made a couple of references to kind of like class privilege earlier in terms of how Han Manu, the poorer individual, is investigated much differently than Shung Jung Jung, right? What do you know about Korea in this area? Because I've seen like movies like Parasite that come from Korea and it seems like the, the class consciousness is a thing, right? Like this, this isn't like a, a one-off thing that this is an ongoing conversation with Korea. Did you think like the characters were treated differently based on their social status? For me, it was hard to tell because, you know, like you, you mentioned at one point that we have some unreliable narration happening here. Mm -hmm. So we were getting the police scene from Don's perspective, and she's very angry that the police have not solved this. And I don't really recall exactly how she was able to solve it, frankly. Um, so, sh but she is very convinced that the police looked at Han Manu, the poor working class kid, and just decided he's going to be our guilty scapegoat. And she is convinced that the rich guy did it, mm -hmm. but the rich guy went to America, so he just kind of escapes because of his money, and the poor kid gets beat up and blamed, and so this is how she sees it, and I think she might be right about that, but yeah. other than that, I, I really don't know much about this particular topic okay. in Korean culture, although some K-pop references the different class divides, and you see things like Squid Game that also talk about um, debt and class and stuff like that. So, yeah, no, yeah. I think it was, it was rewarding seeing how rewarding is probably not the right word here. It was, it was an exploration of with Han Manu, like you said, the police put physical abuse on him, like, like literally trying to mistreat him. And I think you bring up a good point about unreliable narration. We don't fully understand what happened with the other individual, but as a result, maybe we're left to assume based on the fact that he was able to escape so easily that we don't hear any of the story. It's kind of like once you get to know 
someone, particularly like Han Manu, the way that she saw suffering in his life. Like I would say to me, I would classify his life as having a lot of different elements of suffering, right? He had cancer, had to lose part of his leg, right? It sounded to me like he signed up for military service. So he definitely saw some violent things. He was abused by the police officers and probably lost a lot of career or even just future opportunities with his name being dragged through the mud as a murder victim. And what happened to the other guy? Right away. He just goes to America and gets away with it. (laughs) At least as much as Don will allow. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But I think that that, to your point, is is what allows Don to kind of assume guilt, right? Like, well, I've gotten to know so much about Han Manu and his sister. He couldn't have been the killer. He had a bag of donuts with him, right? Who brings yeah. a bag of donuts home after just murdering someone? That's impossible. And I'm, well, I can understand that argument. But we do, we do see sympathy. We see empathy. And I think she's trying to find closure, to your point, where her form of justice may not come from the police in this story, right? <laughs> yeah. So yep. I guess a lot of people may be questioning, well, what, what was Christy exactly referring to earlier when you said that she probably had a different form of justice when it came to how she viewed things with, with Tareem? Are, are we going there? Let's do it. <laughs> okay, okay. So we learn, and I, I, I cannot pronounce these correctly, I apologize, but it sounds like the sister was born with a different name, like Hyun or something along those lines. Hyun, yeah. Yeah, Hyun. I know I'm not pronouncing that correct. I apologize. <laughs> but it sounds to me like there was like, um, kind of like how we have accents in America. They've got some too. It sounded like, it, I, it sounded to me like a lower class accent, which is why they kind of changed her name to Hyun later on is how I, another one of those class things, right? So then the second to last chapter, right, Dallin starts talking about that name and you're like, oh, are they talking about the sister? And she's telling her friend, oh, don't worry about that, honey. That's that, that was my sister's name a long time ago. And then in the next, in the final chapter, it's very brief, but it talks about little Hey Heyoon. And we never see a lover of any sort with Daon, which means where'd this baby come from, right? Like that, that's the game that we have to play as the reader. And you said you picked up some, some clues along the way. Yeah, so in the beginning, uh, Dawn is talking a lot about her guilt. And so that's the main clue you get in the beginning is that she feels a heavy guilt about something. And she references it at the very end as well, near the end of the, the final chapter in this novella. Um, but she <laughs> she doesn't ever come right out and say what happens, but you kind of get the feeling that um, you know, where did baby Hyun come from? <laughs> what is, th- and she says at one point that the baby is a gift to her mother who has also been grieving very strongly for Hyun, mm-hmm. the sister who was killed. And at one point as well, um, this baby that belonged to Tareem and her husband, I can't remember his name, I apologize. <laughs> uh, Shin um, Jung Jun or something along those lines, I think. Yeah, something like that. Uh, they have a baby that is stunningly beautiful baby <laughs> and you get the connection to the stunningly beautiful Heon, and eventually it just clicked for me that him the little baby that don has given to her mother as a gift uh that is the source of her guilt she kidnapped the baby so <laughs> it took me a while to figure that out <laughs> dark Dark, dark kid- kidnapping someone else's child to replace. And, and, and in terms of like justice, she doesn't know for a fact, like it hasn't been proven in a court of like what we would call law that they were for sure guilty. It's just like, okay, well, we know it's not Han Manu. So I think it's you. I'm going to steal your baby is cold blooded. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We, we get the feeling that, I mean, she's probably right because we get a clue into Tarum's head in her perspective chapters that there's some real unhealthiness <laughs> in her life. And you just kind of get the feeling that, you know, Dawn might be right. But how does Dawn know any of this? Like, I think she's just making assumptions. <laughs> mm-hmm. She is. Well, and they talk about in the opening chapter, they talk about, well, that's the problem with, uh, was it creativity is that there is no end or something along those lines. The truth is much more defined. There, there's some quote like that in the first chapter. And even I wrote down in the first chapter too, she has another quote. I know who the murderer is. That's why I did what I did. 
And I know I'll never be free from this crime until the day that I die. So this whole time, I'm just like, what was your crime, Daun? And it wasn't until like the last page where I'm like, (gasps) (laughs) brutal. Yeah. (laughs) So you followed that all the way through. And that was a question you had in your head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I kindled it. So I immediately highlighted that line. And I also highlighted like the, gosh, now I wish I had written that down for this talk today. There's like a talk about um, a part about imagination or creativity having no ends. So you can see that she's filling in her own gaps to kind of like make this story fit that the police could never actually prove or at least chose not to prove because they maybe needed to blame it on the poor guy, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) It's super sad. It's super sad. All right. So. So we've been talking up a lot of things, but maybe there's some parts that didn't resonate with us as much as well. Were there any parts where you're just like, mm, this didn't work for me, or you wish you had been expanded or even just cut, perhaps? Yeah, she had um, some kind of philosoph- She At the beginning, we see that Dan pretty much feels like there's no meaning to life. There's mm-hmm. just a lot of suffering. There's stuff happening all over the world that she doesn't understand. Um, and so obviously she believes there is no God, like that's what she says directly in there. Mm -hmm. Um, so you kind of wonder where she's going to land by the end of the novel. You just know that she's very depressed in the beginning and has, you know, nothing in her mind that makes life meaningful, but her experience with Han Manu and getting to know him and seeing how he just lives very joyfully and simply in a lot of ways, um, and then dies to her again without meaning um she just feels like his life is totally unfair and um decides that i guess you know he was able to live in the moment and just enjoy the life that he had as much as he could and that that is probably the meaning of life so that philosophical idea i just felt like i I don't know kind of i wasn't super impressed by it Mm -hmm. (laughs) so she was trying to infuse i think some meaning Mm -hmm. Um, philosophically and it didn't really work for me very well i was the exact same boat and um i think even when they started to talk about christianity that again how it was represented i was just like yeah i don't i don't know if i would have said it that way like that seems a little questionable but even even like nihilism i'm like yeah i don't think atheists say it that way either like it was kind of like for again this is my western view of things I felt like it was too in between things. Like it just, it didn't understand, I think, Christianity enough. And I don't think it's done, it understood nihilism enough for it to kind of make sense for me. The way that it was yeah. just like, well, what's, what's value in our lives? And Darwin's like, well, there is no value. Life is meaningless, basically. And you can, you know, you can write your own rules in life is kind of what she was, I think, meant to portray. Yeah. It did feel like that area where she was writing felt maybe under-researched, like she, like you were saying. Like, she didn't really understand the different viewpoints on this topic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could be. It could be. Maybe it's my own understanding or even translation and the process of it, but yeah. it just wasn't the best part for me, particularly when this, it was like, I think it was the penultimate section when they were talking about suffering, of like, well, why is there suffering in this world? And I'm like, man, for a 160-page book to just kind of scratch the surface, like, that's that's all you're going to get yeah. is... is you know you're going to get a, a surface scratching that if you want super details on that, you're going to have to go to probably some other books. So for me, those are the parts where I'm like, Man, either, either expand that and really go into detail on that with, with this grief thing or just cut it because it just, I don't know if it worked as well for me, but I, it sounds to me like it was the same for you as well. Yeah. Whereas I think that the personal grief that she felt and the grappling that she did, I thought that was very well done. Um, but when she tried to make it like more universal, I think that was where it lost mm. me a bit. Okay. Okay. I think we can understand that on a personal level that like when, when something bad happens, don't we want to know there's design behind it like or a reason for it, right? Like, like this stinks. It really sucks to hear the answer of just like, well, wrong place, wrong time, kid, right? Like we, we want to assign meaning. We want to assign design, I think, as human beings. And how do you go about doing that? And that's a big step to then take that, like you said, that step back to say, okay, you know, here, here's our, here's our moral system. Here's our way of viewing, you know, what justifies things. And and it was for a 160 page book, pretty ambitious, pretty ambitious. But yeah. <laughs> I, I think it pulled enough off. And I think, you know, walking into, I mean, you know, it's 160 pages going into it. I think you got to know that that's just going to kind of get swept aside real quick that I try not to discredit it too much, but it's worth calling out that, this is probably not where you stop that conversation. 
Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's all the main notes that I wanted to cover today here. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of talk about? I think that was all of it. That was a good discussion. Okay. So let's let's wrap this up with uh do we want to do ratings? I know you've got like your your hundred point scale. I think I think I've shared maybe yeah, I said sure. it already in this talk. Like I'm kind of between a three and a four star out of five. Like I think I'll round it up to four. Um, but some somewhere in that range is, is kind of how I felt with this one. Very similar for me. I was kind of landing around a 75 out of 100. Okay. So pretty, pretty, it was very enjoyable, <laughs> I would yeah. say. Yeah, I don't regret reading it at all. I really don't. No. To the point of going back and checking through some things, very fun. Um, I, I really wish I could say more about what was pulling me back, but I don't think there was anything wrong. It's just I wish there was more or better fleshed out certain things, which is what maybe have knocked it down for me. Right. Yeah, I think so. Okay. It's hard when we've just when we've read the Brothers Karamazov within the last year or so. Yeah. With the, all of its talk about suffering and all that, it's just like so hardy. But you can't you can't the, these two can't really be compared in that way. So mm -hmm. it's hard with that same theme in there. It's like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you want to explore this more, go check out Brothers Karamazov, right? <laughs> yeah. We have like five live streams about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over on Christy's channel. Again, link will be in the description below for you. If you haven't already subscribed, I'm assuming you have. Make sure you go over and check out her channel. Lovely discussions over there. Christy, thank you so much for coming on and spending some time with us today. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. All right, guys. Peace out. Bye.